Welcome to another episode of The Ninja and the Gora. Today we have got Nick Bilbra from the Hands of Project, which is an online storytelling and English uh, language learning project. Uh, welcome, Nick. Hi, Nick. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you aboard. Okay, so uh, our first question to you, Nick, is could you take us back a bit and tell us how did the project start, the Hands of Project? Right at the beginning. Well, um, it started, I was invited to Palestine um, with the British Council. And there's a project, I, you might know about it, I don't know if it's also been in UAE, but it's been in various um, countries in the region. It's called the uh, Kids Read Project. So this was a project about um, telling stories to kids, encouraging kids to um, get interested in reading um through storytelling and i went over there to do that project and i was just blown away really um by well first of all i was blown away by just the enthusiasm for story that exists in that part of the world mm -hmm. among teachers and among kids um i think i've i don't think i've ever been anywhere in the world where there is that much enthusiasm for story mm. and st particularly story as a kind of means of teaching sto storytelling as a teaching tool um so i was kind of really impressed with that and i thought i don't know lately i've been you know the last 10 years or so i've spent a long time traveling around the world doing different talks at conferences and i've kind of got a bit Mm, disillusioned I suppose with the whole thing of masses of air miles going in somewhere where you don't really know much about the context and kind of training people and being a foreign expert you know there's this idea of the Jai Joe the jet in jet out expert someone who comes in and sort of tells people what to do and then goes away again so I sort of felt very uncomfortable about that and I wondered whether um, there was a way of doing something online, you know, doing something, doing some kind of storytelling mm. online. Because, I mean, at the same time as feeling I didn't want to be kind of colonial and bring in uh, a system onto these people who were doing lots of very creative things already in their classes, I also felt um, that there's a real need, especially in a place like Gaza, for people to have contact with the outside world. Most people under the age of 20 have never been out. So it was really exciting for me, the idea that we could do some kind of storytelling and expose kids to language um, without having to go there um, and without them having to leave because it's so difficult for them to leave. So I was approached by, about that same time, I was approached by an organization called Tamar Institute for Community Education in northern Gaza. And they asked me if I'd like to do some storytelling once a week with a group of kids. We used to use Skype at that time. I'd never even heard of Zoom then. <laughs> and I just started telling stories to a group of kids uh, once a week. Um, I'd written a book for the British Council of Palestine called Stories Alive, which is a very simple storytelling book, uses lots of um, traditional stories. Mm. And I started using that material online uh, with them. And that from then on, it just kind of grew. Um, people started saying, well, can we do sessions in our school? Mm um and can we do sessions and i also started working in zatari refugee camp for syrian kids in jordan and also lots of people found out what i was doing and said they'd like to be involved as well as as storytellers so i mean initially i was kind of thinking it would just be something i did alongside my regular work at that point i was working at marjon university in plymouth doing teacher training and trainer training. But it quickly became something that I needed to devote all my time to. Um, so I was kind of doing it for about a year, full time, six, seven days a week, um, without any income at all. I mean, it was 
basically nearly bankrupt me <laughs> basically um but um i could just feel that there was really something in this it was it's a lot of interest in it um and scott thornbury uh, who i'm sure you know know well um got very interested in the project and he actually in his plenary talk at IATEFL conference in Birmingham in 2016 he actually showed a small snippet of an activity that we'd done in one of the sessions at the end of his talk and he was he was kind of showcasing the hands up project as a way um, to provide communicative language teaching and learning opportunities for kids in an environment where like Gaza where they don't have many opportunities to do that and that was really the launch of the hands up project as a charity um, from then um, people got very interested in the project we started to get more and more people interested in funding us um, and we're now funded by um, schools all around the world lots of different language schools donate certain amount every month mm. um, individuals donate quite a lot of money so we're now um, I'm now an employee of the hands up project and we also employ an administrator in Gaza as well um, this is a bit of a sort of two or three pronged question here uh, first of all the, the stories you tell uh, are, are they original um, secondly uh, the workshops you run how often do you run them and how do you organize them as, it's, as I said, it started just with me doing one hour a week with a group of kids. Um, I mean, under normal circumstances, when schools are open, we do something like five or six different sessions a day. And we've got sessions seven days a week. Um, I mean, schools are open in Gaza normally six days a week every day except Friday, but we also have sessions in, in kind of extracurricular um, schools um, on Fridays. So we do that. Um, we work with around probably about 500 kids a week when schools are open and there we're just normally tapping into regular classes. So we work with a teacher in the room. There's always a teacher in the room with the kids. And we have volunteers who connect through Zoom to that teacher. Um, we've got something like, it's really hard to say because it keeps changing, but something like 60 to 70 volunteers around the world. Would you elaborate a bit on their experience to volunteers and how does one go about joining the program to volunteer? Okay, so we run a training course every Friday. We run training courses for new volunteers. Um, and so if people send us an email, we, 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 um, we put them onto a training course. I do the training courses. And it's, we, what we do now, we used to do like a one-week course. We now make it much more kind of, we just do a kind of short burst of training. Okay. And then we get people into the into their own sessions. So I think most of the learning happens um, through doing the sessions really, rather than sort of, I've always, I'm always a bit uncomfortable with kind of training people to do things before they've yeah. actually had the experience of it. So we also run training sessions every Friday for existing volunteers, yeah. um, every Friday afternoon. So that might be on something like green screen storytelling or remote theater activities or lots of different aspects of our work the stories are they are they original stories or do you adapt them or uh who comes up with the stories what are the okay. themes and which ones do the children most relate to okay so um the book that i wrote um which is called stories alive that uses a lot of half the book is kind of traditional stories that everyone knows like you know i mean aesop's fables like 
the lion and the mouse and um, the jackal and the crow and those kind of things. But, we all, but it also uses um, traditional stories, traditional Palestinian stories. Um, and there are some lovely traditional Palestinian stories, like um, there's one about called Tunjar, um, which is about a, a, a woman who gives birth to a cooking pot. <laughs> it's an amazing story. Um, and there's a kind of traditional Cinderella type story called Jibene, and a lovely story called The Farmer Who Followed His Dream. So we, the kids love those stories that are about Palestine. Mm. And the interesting thing that we found when I've done training with teachers about this is often the teachers will say, oh, I remember that story. Mm. I remember my grandmother telling me that story. Nice. But kids in Palestine now, they've lost them. They, 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 they're lost. So that's another important thing i think that we're doing is we're trying to reinstate those those um traditional palestinian stories and um so it's all part of kind of boosting palestinian culture as well it's an important part of of what we do is is that boosting their culture and giving them a voice and make helping them to feel proud of their of their home yeah now you, you mentioned they're giving them a voice um some of the some of the, the stories are written by the kids themselves, aren't they? So please, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, we we realised very quickly that it wasn't going to be enough um, if it was just us telling stories. Yeah. We quickly realised that the kids wanted to tell stories too. So quite often, um, that book that I wrote, Stories Alive, it, it contains play scripts as well so the kids can kind of act out the plays um i very quickly realized like i'd, I'd do a story one session and then the teacher would say to me in the next session she'd say oh um they've just prepared a performance of the play of the story that you told me can they perform it through zoom so this whole idea of remote theater kind of came out of this really mm -hmm. so it's something that comes from gaza i think i don't think anyone was doing remote theater in the world apart from you know before people in gaza started doing it mm -hmm. so this is kind of performing a play through zoom yeah. yeah so how do you do it where you've got this tiny screen what do you do you know how can you how can you make the best use of that um so you know some of those traditional stories they perform them at conferences they've been performed at conferences in uh the uk at um the iotefl conference um at um conferences in turkey chile many different places around the world and then the first time i went to gaza I, was, I went with Scott Thornbury, who's now a trustee of the Hands Up Project. And we were just talking on the way back because we'd been really inspired by a performance of a play that the kids had created themselves. So these kids, they just made a play themselves and they performed it to us. And we thought, I wonder if there's a way we can kind of create a competition mm -hmm. for making a play. So from that, the Hands Up Project playwriting competition was born. And um, we, the first year we had something like 88, I think we had 88 entries the first year. Second year we had 180 entries. Um, and we're now in the third year. And so it just keeps growing all the time. And, and what we do is we, we encourage the, the rules of the competition are that they have to make a play in one take. Mm. And it has to be with a maximum of five actors and five minutes long. Mm. They can't do any editing at all. So the reason for that is because, well, the first year we ran the competition, we didn't have those rules. Yeah. And we had some amazing plays submitted but they were basically films, some of them. And it was a bit like, 
what they'd done is teachers had worked really hard making a film and they maybe got one one of the kids to say a line until they were really comfortable with it film that little bit and then added it to something else so we had the case where it looked like kids could speak really good english but actually it was just the skills of the filmmaker really that we were looking at rather than the so we decided to make it into um, a, a, a one take thing. Um, and I think that's much better for language learning. And it also means that we've now got lots of plays that can be performed remotely. Yeah. So they can be performed at conferences. Um, every Saturday now we do this thing called Sata Play Live on Facebook where we meet a teacher and some of the kids who've been involved in the playwriting competition. And sometimes they perform their play live, or sometimes we show the, just show the video of it, but we also talk to the kids about what it means to them to perform a play and to be involved in drama. Um, sorry, this is going off on, on all kinds it's of different right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, uh, are you going on? I can't stop. Once I start talking, I can't stop. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Who are the kids that benefit from this, Nick? Well, we only work with um, UNRWA schools, which is you know, United Nations Relief and Works Agency. So these are, this is the uh, organisation that provides education to the refugee population of Palestine and Ministry of Education schools. So we don't work with private schools at all. Okay. Um, and... I mean, it's the benefits to them are incredible. I mean, I was so touched. I was actually in tears um, about a week ago. I got a message from a girl in Gaza who's now 18. And she was 12 when we first started. And she said, Oh, thank God I finally found you. I've been trying to find you for ages just to thank you because those sessions that we did um they just boosted my self-esteem so much and they made me love um english and she's now studying english and french at the islamic university in gaza and she said you know one of the most interesting things that she said was hands up project sessions taught me that I didn't have to get every single word right in what I was saying. It was just a massive boost to my confidence because I realized I could communicate with someone in another country and I didn't have to get the present perfect continuous exactly right. I didn't have to pronounce every word exactly right. I could just be myself and I could just communicate. And, and, and I think that's a massively liberating thing for so many people. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, I mean, the benefits of, of creating a play and then performing it um, and knowing that people all around the world are um, watching that play is yeah. so empowering for kids. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm, I'm probably most proud of, of what we've achieved in the Hands Up Project is, is these books. So what we do with the, um, we, we get 30 of the plays and we make a book out of them. Yeah. And then every time I go to Palestine, I take, we take a copy of the book for all the kids and we give them, we give each, each child a copy of the, of the book. And they're, you know, something they'll keep forever mm. and they'll show their grandparents. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing as well is that these books have been bought by teachers all around the world. So as a teacher, I was at a conference in Peru and a teacher bought some copies of the book. And then she sent me videos of her students performing plays that were written by Palestinian kids. Fantastic, yeah. So, I mean, imagine the impact on those kids of seeing someone in another context performing their play. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, well. And at last year at IATEFL, the IATEFL conference, we did quite an in I did quite an interesting workshop 
where we got scripts of some of the plays and we got all the pe people who were at our my conference talk to perform little snippets of the plays and perform them back to the original order, um, or, uh, authors through Zoom. So we had like Jeremy Harmer oh, yeah. <laughs> performing a play made by kids in Gaza. Amazing. And you know the most beautiful thing? They were all acting in these plays. And then at the end, we said to the kids in Gaza, what do you think of their performance? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, hmm, <laughs> not bad. Not bad, but you haven't quite, you haven't quite nailed it, you know. And I think that's, that's beautiful, that they had the honesty mm. to say that and didn't just say, oh, it was great. <laughs> I think when you write something, you want it to be performed with the same passion that you perform it with yourself. And yeah. Yeah. so, yeah. Well, Nick, you've spoken so much about their language development and the confidence it's given them. And you've traveled yourself to Gaza multiple times. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. What are the children like? You know, uh, I just, uh, what are their personalities like? What has touched you personally about them? Well, they're incredible. I mean, they're just incredible. When you think of the context that people live in, in Gaza, I mean you know, shortages of clean drinking water, some places only having four hours of electricity in a 24 hour period. Um, you know, the feeling that the whole world has abandoned them. It's amazing in a context like that, that you meet kids who are so, so full of enthusiasm for life and so willing to learn, so hardworking and so dedicated. I mean, I've known the case where teachers, a teacher's practice to play with the students one day, and then the next day, they all come to class, they've all just learned their lines without even being asked to do it. They've just learned their lines and they, um, and so, that's one of the things. I mean, they're just, and because of the fact that they've been isolated for such a long time. And that's why we try and keep these sessions as light as possible. We try and make them as fun as possible. We try and make them as fluency focused as possible, not focusing on grammar or anything too much. Um, yeah, I mean, they're amazing kids. And the first time I went to Gaza, it was such a lovely moment when I got to the place where the conference was taking place. And I was suddenly met by loads and loads of kids who previously I'd only met online. So when you suddenly meet somebody who you've only seen online before, it's, it's quite a, it's a powerful thing. Yeah. And I can remember just getting back to the hotel in Jerusalem. That was the first time I went to Gaza, we just went for a day. Um, and I just remember getting back to the hotel room in Jerusalem and just getting into the room and just tears and tears and tears, just crying, 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 just and the, just the feeling that how could people be so full of life? Nick, you, you've spoken with massive enthusiasm um, about your project. What does it, what does it mean? Uh, Professionally, obviously, it's it's a great thing. What about personally? How, what does it mean personally to you? I mean, I've literally put everything of myself into this. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, I've learned so much about... I've learned so much about Palestine. I've learned so much about how we shouldn't believe what... The media tells us about places. Um, I've learned so much about teaching and learning as well, because I think, you know, often as as teachers, we can think um, the communicative approach is the be all and end all, mm. and you know, we should be almost 
evangelizing about it and telling everyone this is what you should be doing. Um, I think in contexts like Gaza, where you've got huge classes, maybe 50 students or more in a class, you've got very few resources. Um, the communicative approach isn't necessarily always the right thing to do. And there are approaches that people have used there um, which work very well. I mean, I've been very impressed with, I've, I've, met, I've met children in Gaza um, and I've thought, oh, this person's lived in the USA for several years or something. And then I discover they've never been out of the Gaza Strip. <laughs> And it's incredible. So I think that thing of, you know, pe the, the classic thing that people say is in a place like Gaza where there's nothing to do, you know, there's nowhere to go, all you can do is study. Mm. And, and if in a place like Gaza, you know, if people really do value education. Mm. And that's, that's very, it's very nice to work with with people who who value education so much could i ask you um any regrets um yeah i didn't start it earlier i guess <laughs> um, yeah. that's perfect yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah um maybe maybe regrets i think what's happened now is We've got to a point with the charity where I'm trying to get things happening independently of me. Right, mm. yeah. Because I'm getting a lot of emails all the time, lots of messages. Uh, and I think maybe for too long, it was too focused on me. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, my dream now is really to get lots of schools around the world linked to schools in Gaza. Okay. And that's already happening yeah. quite a bit. I mean, I did a, a big tour of the Balkan states um, the end of last year. So I was in Kosovo and Bosnia and Croatia and uh, Albania. And that was really nice. So we're doing lots of link-ups between schools in Gaza and schools there. Yeah. And we do this, we do this thing called um, show and tell, intercultural show and tell. So we've been linking up kids in both, well, when schools were open, that's what we were doing. I just had a thought there that, you know, you've been using education and technology like it's been used in the past two months. You've been doing that for several years. So the rest of the world has just caught on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what, what difference has that made on your project, the recent lockdown and the schools closing and the people being available right. experts, yeah? First of all, when we first heard that schools were going to close, we panicked. We thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then I think we suddenly went into perhaps our most creative period ever. <laughs> And we started thinking, okay, we'll do, we'll have to do Facebook Live. Yeah. Um, so we, we stopped using Zoom completely because people didn't have, people in Gaza don't have Zoom in their, you know, they haven't got strong enough internet connection in their homes to, to do that kind of thing. Um, so we started doing Facebook Live and, and we got loads of different storytellers, people who hadn't been involved in the Hands Up project before yeah. to do sessions. And also, it's quite interesting to do a story without having the video of the listeners. So, you know, we had to kind of rely on the comments. Mm. <laughs> and I think some of the storytellers have done amazing things by um, uh, done amazing things by sort of getting getting the um, get, asking a question to the audience and then getting you incorporating the answers into the story. And I think that that's a nice way of working through Facebook Live. Yeah. Now, the other positive thing that's happened is because Facebook Live 
um, is open to anyone. You don't need a link or anything. Anyone who's on our Facebook page can access the sessions. This has meant that we've got people in lots of different countries attending the sessions. So we're making more connections between young people in Palestine and young people in other countries, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we've started doing Zoom sessions again with kids in their own homes. So we've got sessions like, we've got a nice session on every Wednesday, we do a session called Students Versus Teachers. <laughs> and we have um, kids from Ecuador, Gaza, um, the West Bank, um, Spain, Nepal, Bosnia, you name it, all over the place participating in these sessions. And the, the idea is we have a different topic each week might be science, it might be animals, it might be um, food. And the students have to create questions to ask the teachers. And it's just really, it's lovely because it's like just turns on, on its head the normal kind of status patterns of teachers in control asking the questions. And I think it's such a lovely thing to do. And it's also encouraging. So we use the breakout room feature. Right. on zoom and we encourage the kids we put the kids in mixed nationality groups and they prepare the questions together so some lovely communication happening between between the kids um and one other thing which also goes back to your previous question andy about um what are they like the kids in in gaza in gaza well, one of the things that we've noticed from doing these Zoom sessions with kids in different countries is that actually the kids in Palestine are so much more used to this form of communication mm. that they're generally better at it than <laughs> kids in other places. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots, of, there's lots of things that they've kind of learned about communicating through a webcam, like, making eye contact, looking at the green light and making eye contact, um, speaking very clearly, not using words which are very culturally specific and that kind of thing. Wow. So in a way, they're the kind of experts in this. Right. Um, well, what surprised me there when, when you said there was a bit of a panic, because you've been doing this for so long. I, th I thought you'd be an old hand at it, and I thought it would just be sort of... Well, I suppose it was just the thought that no one's going to school. Yeah. Because the other thing that happened, I didn't mention this actually, um, because no one was going to school, um, UNRWA asked us if we could deliver the curriculum as well through um, Facebook Live sessions. So in the beginning of the lockdown, we were doing um, three... No, sorry, we're doing two story t Facebook Live storytelling sessions, and we're also doing two um, English for Palestine sessions a day. So it was kind of thinking how, you know, people have never used Facebook Live before. Mm. How do we do a session that's going to be engaging and motivating for the kids using the the, all the language from the course book that they were missing from their regular classes? So... And it was, we were all kind of in two minds about whether to do it as well, because in a way it's a little bit against the ethos of, of what we're trying to do in the Hands Up Project, because we're not really sort of focusing on grammar. Yeah. But at the same time, we wanted to support those kids, because we know that they're still going to have an exam at yeah. some point, which is going to test them on, on these forms. Um, so in the end, we kind of did a, halfway house between you know focusing on grammar but making it as communicative as possible mm -hmm. um, and we we actually developed another session which we called tent we call it tense conversations okay. um which is sort of taking a tense each week but making it kind of just really light on the focusing on language very very little just the bare minimum and just yeah. trying to make it as communicative as possible using that tense in communicative ways 
I have one final question, Nick. Uh, what about the parents' role in all of this? Uh, so the teachers obviously in Gaza have been very supportive. The students are brilliant. And sometimes the sessions are going on from their homes. So yeah. were they a bit afraid of this at first or are they supportive? Well, that's another, I'm really glad you asked me that because that's another great thing that's happened um, because of the corona pandemic. I mean, and because of the fact that we're doing Facebook live sessions. So whereas before, um, you know, parents didn't really know what was happening in our hands up project sessions because they were all happening at school. Now kids are accessing the sessions in their own homes and maybe they're, maybe they're asking their parents for help. What does, what's that word mean? Or maybe the, or maybe the parents are writing mm. the comments because the kids, can't write in English or you know it's harder for them so maybe the the parents are writing what the kids say or also in some cases I think the level of English of the kids is higher than the parents so they're also learning English from their kids okay. <laughs> so you know I'm, I'm I wish some I'd love it if somebody would research all of this kind of I mean, I think not just in the, within the Hands Up project, but I think that's something that's happened all around the world, that parents are suddenly much more involved in their children's learning because of, because of the lockdown. Yeah. So. Yeah, yes, it's very important. Um, yeah. We've been yeah. talking to those school principals here as well, and they've said the same, that they've been phenomenal, the parents, and even the dads are getting involved, and you know, it's been great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nick, it's, uh, it's an incredible journey. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for sharing it with us. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and learning uh, about Absolutely. the Hands Up Project. Thank you very Thank much you. for that. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, okay. You. See you. Bye-bye.